Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third and final day of this conference. Um, uh, as with the other days, we're going to have a series of talks. Uh, and I just knew that uh, on the right side of the user interface, you have a chat. There's also a Q&A section, and you can post questions there. I will monitor these questions, and I will ask them to the speaker uh, at the end of their talk. Um, uh, and with that, I think I'll jump right in and uh, introduce our first keynote speaker, well, our second keynote speaker of the conference. This is He Vandenbroek. He is an associate professor and Samueli fellow at the Computer Science Department at UCLA. Uh, many of you here will know his work on the Problock language while he was uh, at Leuven. Uh, today, he works on a range of topics which spans statistical relational learning, graphical models, lifted inference, and of course, probabilistic programming. Uh, his work has been recognized uh, by Best Papers Awards uh, at UAI, ILP, and KR. He's been the recipient of a number of other accolades, including the NSF Career Award, the Sloan Fellowship, and the Computers and Thoughts Award at HKI 2019. Uh, we're delighted to have he here. Um, uh, he, if you're ready, uh, you can unmute your camera and uh, take it away. Uh, let's see. So it appears that uh, he has dropped off for a moment, maybe to reload his interface. I saw him say earlier that he couldn't hear my audio. Uh, so we're just going to wait a moment for him to rejoin. So I see that he is rejoining now, so we'll just give it another few moments. Hello. There we are. Hey, Keith, welcome. Uh, I, I, I believe if the technical issues are now resolved and you're ready to go, please take it away. Uh, thanks. So let me just start the presentation. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea what you just said, so I'm just uh, assuming you said I, I only said nice things about he, me. He is a terrible researcher. Uh, <laughs> we don't know why we have him at this conference. Yeah, we were, uh, <laughs> I was the fifth choice, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's, so thanks for having me, and uh, sorry for the little problem here. Um, yeah, I'm very wonderful. honored to be here, and I guess I can I can start, I suppose. Um, all right. So um, the talk the talk that I wanted to give uh, today is about. Uh, how to go from probabilistic circuits to probabilistic programs, and also how to go back. Uh, and uh, maybe that doesn't make sense right now. So let me maybe start with like a high level motivation for uh, you know, why you should care about this particular topic. And uh, I, I'll try to be a bit provocative, even though maybe for this audience, it will not be provocative at all. Um, so here's a provocative statement. Um, Probabilistic graphical models are kind of the staple of how we do probabilistic AI. Uh, they've been around for many decades. And so the provocative statement is that graphical models that capture variable level dependencies or independencies, they are really a broken abstraction. Um, and I think many uh, of the people in the audience know this, and there's very simple examples to illustrate this fact. So for example, uh, if you want to capture the distribution of a deck of cards uh, as a graphical model, you'll have to introduce a node for every card in the deck. Uh, and the value would be, you know, what is the type of the card? And then if you want to connect all of these different random variables together uh, using edges to capture dependencies, uh, you end up with this graphical model here. Everything's connected to everything. Okay. Um, if you come from the statistical relational learning community, you're very familiar with this issue. If you have something like a Markov logic network and you try to interpret it as a graphical model that captures variable level independencies, then again, everything is completely connected. Um, even if you're from the probabilistic programming community, you're very familiar with this. And so here, uh, I, I took an example that I stole from the, the Facebook people. Uh, and uh, about their new probabilistic programming language, the Bean Machine. I think they will give a presentation about it in an hour. 
And uh, one of the observations here is that if you write this uh, probabilistic program as a graphical model, then very quickly you run into the limitations of graphical models because some of these dependencies here that are represented by edges, they only really exist in a certain context. And, and so this is where the graphical model formalism kind of fails. Okay, so let's try to come up with a, a better solution. Uh, by the way, if you hear a chainsaw outside of my office, that's because someone's cutting down a tree. So I apologize if there's there's extra noise. Okay, um, so maybe probabilistic graphical models are not exactly what we want here. And so what would be the alternative? And so what I'm trying to postulate here is that uh, computational abstractions of distributions are uh, kind of the modern alternative. So let's think of distributions as objects that are uh, computed. And so the abstraction here is not, you know, which variables depend on which other variables in a graph, but it's the structure of our program, of our computation, that actually uh, gives us uh, the high level overview of what this distribution is actually doing. And um, now you're thinking, well, maybe you're you're rolling your eyes because this is something that you're all familiar with, you're all probabilistic programming uh, researchers. Uh, and so, yes, I am, of course, talking about probabilistic programs. Uh, however, maybe to your surprise, I'm not exclusively talking about probabilistic programs. So there are other formalisms out there that follow this same philosophy of uh, having a computational model of a distribution uh, and then, you know, doing in some sense better than what we could do with probabilistic graphical models uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Okay, um, so what do I want to talk about today? Well, since you all know about probabilistic programs, maybe I will surprise you with some little tutorial uh, about probabilistic circuits and then also some overview of the recent work that my, my research lab has been doing on that topic. And then at the very end, I'll tell you how probabilistic programs and probabilistic circuits are related to each other. And then uh, actually in, 20, in uh, maybe an hour, uh, Stephen Holson will give a talk about uh, his new probabilistic programming language, uh, which will also make this connection uh, much more clear. Okay, so uh, on the agenda for the next half hour, uh, what are probabilistic circuits? Why are they interesting? Why should you care? And what are the cool things you can do with them? And um, I wanna start with this overview here. And so this is a subset of all of the probabilistic models you will find in the machine learning literature. Um, and it's a huge mess, right? So there's uh, kind of the classical ones, the ones that you got in your uh, introduction to AI textbook, things like Naive Bayes. Uh, there's uh, things like Bayesian networks here, right? So these are some of the classics. Um, but then there's also variational autoencoders, which are really popular today. Uh, GANs, of course. You know, GANs have to appear in every talk. Um, autoregressive flows. Uh, there's all sorts of different uh, deep generative models here, and also the classical graphical models, and, and then a whole bunch of stuff that you may have never have heard of, uh, but I will explain some of them. And so the question is, how do I look at this picture and make sense of this alphabet soup? And um, well, maybe the first thing to note is that some of these models are tractable and some of them are intractable. So what does this mean? If I have a naive base model, let's say, then I want to compute the probability of my class variable given my features. I can do this uh, very efficiently in linear uh, time in the size of my uh, naive base model. Uh, some of these other models have similar properties, uh, thin junction trees, uh, tree shaped Bayesian networks. And so these we will all call tractable. And there's a few acronyms here that you may not know, but they will make an appearance uh, in a few minutes. And then on the other side, we have the intractable models. Uh, and so GANs are in some sense the worst offender here. They uh, don't even allow you to really compute any probability in your distribution the way you would like to in, in a probabilistic program, for instance, or in a Bayesian network, because there is no actual explicit probability of anything. There is no likelihood function. Uh, some other models have an explicit likelihood function like the variational autoencoder, but then the problem is that computing it exactly is completely intractable and uh, you can only approximate it, right? And so this is a, an important distinction that I'd like to make between tractable and uh, intractable models. Okay, um, so let's zoom in a little bit in the, uh, into these tractable models because you know maybe you're familiar with GANs and variational autoencoders, but these tractable models are maybe less familiar to you. And uh, I will just give a very quick tour of all of the different models that have appeared in the literature in the last 20 years. And I will just uh, not explain them and just kind of flash a picture in front of you. So this is a tree shaped Bayesian network. It's a tractable model, and you learned about it in your uh, kind of Bayesian networks intro to AI uh, lecture. 
Uh, this, here, this here is an arithmetic circuit, very popular in the Bayesian network community. We have a sum product network, very popular in the machine learning community. Uh, this is a probabilistic sentential decision diagram, an and or graph, a cut set network, a probabilistic uh, decision graph, a, a DDNNF, a, a BDD, and a SDD for doing weighted model counting. And so why am I showing you all of these things? Well, um, all of these different models have been proposed as like modern ways of representing probability distributions, but they're all slightly different, mostly in their syntax, but also in their properties. And so each of these models has a reason to exist. They all have kind of important new contributions they make to the field. But the uh, issue is that, yeah, it's, it's impossible to really make sense of this uh, literature. And, um, you know, hence the quote, every talk needs a joke and the literature overview slide not necessarily distinct. Um, all right, so what is our goal here? So the goal of probabilistic circuits is to say that all of these different things, you don't really have to understand them one by one. Um, all you need to do is understand this unifying framework that kind of explains all of these different uh, um, machine learning models uh, and also explains what they are able to do, what, what they're able to compute efficiently, what they're not able to do, and what the trade-offs are. And so this is the framework of uh, probabilistic circuits uh, to explain all these things. Okay, um, so now I would like to just give a mini uh, six slide tutorial on what are these probabilistic circuits and why are they tractable. Um, and uh, it will be a little bit high level, but I, I hope I can convey the key points here. So, so what you see here is, is a probabilistic circuit. It's a tiny one that fits on a slide and it really looks exactly like a neural network where you have your input layer, uh, which is shown in gray here, and then you have your output uh, neuron, which is the, the root here of this uh, directed acyclic graph. Then all of these nodes in the middle are little computational units, just like you would in a neural network, okay? Uh, so no surprises there. Uh, however, we'll have to assume a few extra things about what these neurons are actually doing. And uh, the first thing that you'll have to assume is that these inputs here, they're not just features, but they are little distributions in their own right. Um, so these input nodes, they could be a univariate Gaussian, uh, maybe some Dirichlet, uh, some Laplace, uh, maybe a, a Bernoulli or some categorical uh, random variable, but it should be a very simple little distribution that you know how to handle, that is not posing you any computational challenges, right? Um, and so, uh, for example, here, this input distribution here says the variable x2 has a probability of 100% to be set to 1 and probability 0 uh, of being set to 0, right? So this is a little uh, indicator function, which is in some sense the most uh, trivial distribution you can ever think of. Okay, um, but they could be Gaussian, continuous, could be, could be really anything that you're willing to plug in here. All right, so then what in this large uh, computation graph are all of these other nodes doing? Well, there's two types of other nodes. Uh, one is a product node shown here in gray. And the product node serves as a way to take two distributions that are uh, talking about different sets of random variables and then combine them into one larger distribution. And so that's the idea of factorization. You take some component distributions that are talking about different things and you multiply them together to get a larger joint distribution. All right, so that's a very simple operator to get a, a slightly epsilon more complicated distribution out of uh, what you started with. Um, the next type of node and the, the only remaining type of node here is a sum node. And a sum node is slightly more interesting. It represents a mixture model. So what you do is you take uh, smaller probabilistic circuits, which are the, the inputs to your neuron, and you uh, combine them together using some weighted average. You're creating a small mixture model uh, over all of these components, and every component, of course, has a weight associated with it, and that weight is here annotated on the edges of the uh, inputs. Okay? So this is kind of like uh, a neuron that combines two distributions into one, uh, of course, this one distribution is slightly more complex because it mixes together these two trivial distributions. And so, for example, if this were a Gaussian and this were another Gaussian, then over here you would get a mixture of Gaussians, which is uh, slightly more complex and slightly more interesting. Okay, And that's really all there is to it. If you now just build uh, a probabilistic circuit like this that has 100,000 or a million uh, edges and parameters, then you have a very large probability distribution. 
Okay. Um, so why would you care about this? Why is this uh, an interesting representation? Well, the whole reason why we cared about these things is because uh, they give us a uh, tractable inference. And you know, if you know, if you work on probabilistic programming, you know that it's very, very difficult to achieve tractability, right? There's just certain programs that it's, it's uh, very, very hard to get accurate estimates of your conditional marginals, for example, or any kind of query you may have. Um, well, it turns out that's not an issue in these representations. And um, I'll just give you one example, which is I want to compute a marginal probability in this distribution. And I'll also explain to you how that is tractable if you are willing to assume two simple properties of this uh, probabilistic circuit. And uh, so I'll try to kind of give the intuition of, of, of why this is, is possible. Um, okay, so first thing you need to do is assume uh, smoothness. And this is a very natural property. Uh, what this really means is that when I have a mixture model, like the sum node is mixing these two uh, smaller distributions together, then those two smaller distributions, they have to have the same random variables in them. And that makes sense, right? You cannot create a mixture of Gaussians where one Gaussian talks about the age of the person and the other Gaussian is about the height of the person. You cannot mix those two things together. Um, and so that's the property of smoothness. Once you have the smoothness property, um, it becomes really easy to compute an integral. And computing an integral is really what you need to do when you want to do a marginal probability inference. Uh, because I have an integral of a sum, right? This mixture model here is a sum. Uh, the sum is weighted. And an integral of a weighted sum is just a weighted sum of the integrals. And so now we can make progress. If I want to do an integration here in my distribution, uh, which is represented by this node, all I really need to do is uh, do an integration uh, computation here in these two children, these two inputs, and then compute the weighted average. Okay, And so that's the reason why in a probabilistic circuit, uh, you can push your integration one level down. But we haven't solved the problem yet, because next we have this multiplication node, and we don't really know how to compute an integral of some product, right? a product of two distributions that, that are factorized. And so here we'll have to assume the second property of our probabilistic circuit, and it's called a decomposability. So decomposability says that in any kind of factorized distribution, the individual factors, uh, they have to be independent of each other. Uh, so x, y, and z here are disjoint sets of variables, and I can multiply them together to get a decomposable product here. And if you have this property, then again, computing an integral becomes easy, because integrating over x, y, and z separately uh, can just be done in each of these uh, little distributions separately, and then you can multiply their, their results. Okay, and, and now we're done, right? So now we, we pushed our integration problem through the sum nodes, through the product nodes, and eventually we reach these very simple distributions that are our inputs here. And so here we have a Gaussian or a Bernoulli or something, something simple that we like, and here we assume that we can efficiently compute uh, all of these integrals. OK, let me give you one example of how this works. And so then I hope you'll be convinced that these models are uh, actually tractable and you can compute things in them that you couldn't compute in a Bayesian network or in a VAE or in, in, in probabilistic program uh, languages. Uh, so here's the example. I want to compute the probability that x2 has some value and that x4 has some other value. What does this mean? Well, there's other variables x1 and x3 that are missing from this marginal inference computation. And so I have to integrate them out. Right, so I have to integrate over x1 and x3. Um, because of what I explained on the previous slides, uh, I can just push my integration problem to the leaves of my probabilistic circuit. If the leaf is a variable that I need to integrate over, like x1, then I get my integral. And so the integral here is 1, of course. All of this probability mass sums to 1. Um, for the variables that I have a, a value that I observe, like x2 and x4, I just have to plug in the likelihood in this little simple distribution. And now I'm really done. I just need to take a product of a sum of a product of a sum, and I get my marginal probability here at the output. Okay, so I hope this made sense. Uh, and I hope you're still hearing me since I have no feedback loop, so I'll just keep going. Um, the point of this exercise is to convince you that, yeah, there are really difficult computational questions that become easy once you have a probabilistic circuit with the right properties, in this case, smoothness and decomposability. But what I just explained to you is just these two check marks here in this larger table. And there's all sorts of other things you might want to know about your distribution. You want to make, uh, maybe compute conditional 
uh, queries, uh, moments, means, um, map inference, marginal map inference, compute entropies, all sorts of divergences, expectations of other functions. And so it turns out that for all of these tasks you want to compute, there is a circuit that does it for you. And all you need to know is whether your circuit has the properties that make these uh, queries tractable or not. And so this is the, the landscape of probabilistic circuits. Um, and so I hope that uh, I was able to convince you that, yeah, these things are tractable, but there, there's also a spectrum to it, right? So depending on what you want to do, uh, some things are easier than others. And so uh, something very, very simple, like a naive base model or a fully factorized distribution, you can compute almost anything in. Uh, something very, very intractable, like a GAN, is, is uh, you cannot even compute a likelihood in. And so there's a whole spectrum in between, which is kind of covered by the table I showed you on the, on the previous slide. Okay, um, now in future, if you have this huge literature on these probabilistic generative models, all you really need to know is what are uh, the properties of the probabilistic circuits version of all of these different things, and it all makes sense to me. There's maybe one more remaining uh, question that you have. It's uh, maybe related to the observation that, yeah, sure, naive base is tractable, but you know, why should I care? Naive base is such a really dumb distribution that I don't really care to fit my data with a naive base model or a tree shared Bayesian network. And so uh, maybe the intuition that you had before this talk is that, yeah, sure, I can come up with some uh, deep generative model that is tractable, but it's not actually going to be very expressive, right? If I'm able to compute, let's say, a marginal probability efficiently, then uh, surely the model is so trivial that I shouldn't care about it. And uh, so here I want to convince you that this intuition is false. Um, so there are these uh, types of uh, probabilistic circuits that are actually both expressive and uh, tractable at the same time. And the way that I'll try to convince you of this fact is by showing you some experiments. And of course, this is not on you know, data sets of the size of uh, 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 ImageNet, but these are reasonable, uh, reasonably large data sets uh, with uh, tens of thousands of examples, uh, hundreds to thousands of features, right? Uh, of how well do I fit my data? How well can I actually fit a density to this data? And what we compare here is the best probabilistic circuit model to the best Bayesian network learner with advanced uh, context-specific CPTs, uh, and then uh, two deep generative models, so uh, some autoregressive uh, models and a variational autoencoder. And I think the summary of this slide is that depending on the data set, either the probabilistic circuit gives you the highest likelihood Sometimes even the classical Bayesian networks do well, which is maybe also a surprise. Sometimes uh, one of the deep generative models does well. But it's really uh, very close and uh, it kind of depends. And this is surprising. Why? Because all of these models, these Bayesian networks and the deep generative models, they're all intractable. They won't allow you to compute a marginal probability. All of these circuits, they are tractable. You can compute any marginal or conditional probability in them in in time linear in the size of your circuit just by evaluating the circuit in the way that I showed you a couple slides ago, right? So here the, 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 the story is that you can get tractability um, without really too much of a compromise. And so you should really think of these tractable models as also being very expressive. All right. Um, so I didn't really tell you about all of these uh, acronyms. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly mention again things like some product networks and arithmetic circuits, which are perhaps most famous. So all of these uh, really live up here. Uh, they're both tractable and expressive. And in that sense, they're very different from your classical uh, tractable models like tree-shaped Bayesian networks. And then other expressive models are our classical uh, deep generative models, uh, but they're completely intractable for almost any kind of query you may want to ask. And uh, if you want to understand these things, uh, I mean, for sure, read the papers, but maybe if you understand what a probabilistic circuit is and why it's tractable, then you also understand what all of these things are doing. Okay, so this was a very quick tutorial just to convince you of a, a few key observations about probabilistic circuits. If you want to know more, then there's this tutorial that we gave at uh, ECML uh, with uh, Yu Cheng Choi, Robert Pehas, and Antonio Vergari. And so you can watch this tutorial, it's three hours, it goes into other types of queries, uh, how to learn uh, the parameters and the structure of these things from data and some more theoretical properties. So there's a lot of good stuff here. 
Uh, if you prefer to read a very nice overview paper uh, written by uh, Yujang and Antonio, then uh, there is a preview on my website where you can just download this paper and it kind of explains the whole framework uh, in a very intuitive way. If you're someone who just likes to look at code and doesn't want to read uh, anything, uh, you may also want to try out our uh, Julia library, uh, which is for, for working with probabilistic circuits, doing uh, inference and learning. And just to show you that these things are actually very, very scalable, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, here in this pseudocode, just tell you, uh, you load some circuit structure, which you could have learned from data, could come from anywhere. Uh, you have maybe a couple 10,000 examples, a couple uh, 100,000 parameters or edges in your circuit. And in 63 milliseconds, you can estimate the maximum likelihood parameters exactly uh, of this model. Why? Because it's tractable, right? So if you care about learning, then you know you should also care about probabilistic circuits. And so please, uh, you know, check out all of this code here. Okay. Um, so this kind of ends my mini tutorial on probabilistic circuits, and uh, I hope things are clear. Um, and for the remainder of my talk, which is not very long, maybe ten minutes, I will uh, try to tell you what my research lab has been doing uh, around probabilistic circuits and and kind of the new things we're trying to uh, develop. Uh, and so this will be kind of a whirlwind tour of a bunch of different topics, just to give you some pointers. Um, okay, so the first question that I was really passionate about maybe a year ago is, you know, these probabilistic circuits, they kind of explain why everything that I know to be tractable is tractable. So are these, tract are these probabilistic circuits really a universal tractable probabilistic model? Anytime I have a model that I can compute something exactly in, is it always going to be a probabilistic circuit? And for a long time, I thought the answer was yes, that this was really the language of uh, all tractability. Um, but then uh, my student Hong Wa and Steven found um, a counterexample. So there are still certain distributions that are popular in machine learning, things like determinantal point processes, for which we don't have a probabilistic circuit representation. And so therefore, when I told you every single tractable model is just a probabilistic circuit, this here is the exception. And uh, so I would uh, encourage you to read this UAI paper from this year, where we kind of go through why, uh, why these particular DPP distributions cannot be represented as probabilistic circuits. Um, and uh, maybe I'll give you a quick answer. So these DPPs, what they do is they tell you that some uh, likelihood or marginal probability can be computed by taking a sub uh, matrix of uh, some matrix that is my model and computing the determinant, the subdeterminant of this matrix. And so computing a determinant can be done efficiently. So this is a tractable model. Uh, this is how I do inference. However, uh, you won't be able to do so with the, the probabilistic circuits that we're currently aware of. And then so a major question here is, you know, these are almost universal tractable languages and we're trying to develop a, a uh, a model that, that really captures all known types of tractability of this form. Okay, so that's the question of the, the representation. Uh, another question is, what can you do with these models? And so here, I want to quickly motivate some of the work we're doing, and I want to motivate it using this uh, AI dilemma. And, you know, this is like a very simplified way people think about AI. There's the old way of doing things, uh, which is logic-based, reasoning-based model-based and it's good at extrapolation and kind of cognitive tasks. And it's really good at some things, but it's also brittle because it doesn't know how to deal with uncertainty. And so this is something everyone's familiar with as the limitation of uh, classical AI. Um, what is maybe more surprising is uh, what I uh, uh, would describe as the limitations of kind of the, the modern machine learning approach to AI. And so we know that this is also really good and effective at uh, dealing with uh, kind of perception task, interpolation, model-free kind of uh, reasoning. But it's also really brittle. And this is something we came to realize in the last few years. Why is it brittle? Because all of these issues come up about bias, fairness, explainability, adversarial attacks, unknown unknowns, issues with calibration, not being able to verify behavior, missingness, data distribution shift. So the, the list goes on and on and on of all of the issues that arise with just end-to-end -end black box uh, supervised machine learning. And it's all because these uh, approaches fail to really understand the, the world and how it works. And they've just been trained to just do one thing without really having a model of the world. And so here, I think that both probabilistic programs and probabilistic circuits are the answer. 
And um, so what we're trying to do is come up with some new synthesis of this uh, pure learning approach with the classical way of doing reasoning about models and specifically probabilistic models of the world. And I'll just give you a very quick preview of what we're doing in algorithmic fairness, in explainability, and in dealing with uh, missing features in machine learning models. And so this is going to be just a little survey of how probabilistic world models are the solution to the problems of end-to-end uh, -end black box uh, machine learning. All right. Um, so um, here's the problem. I have a data set which is complete. It has, let's say, tests for medical tests for all my patients. It has sensor readings for all my sensors. And now I'm training a classifier, some random forest or some, uh, some neural network. It doesn't really matter. But at prediction time, suddenly uh, one of my tests becomes unavailable or too expensive. One of my sensors fails. And so now my predictive model becomes completely useless because my neural network assumes that it has access to this feature and it doesn't really know how to deal with the, 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 the missingness of this feature. Um, and so the solution that we are looking at uh, is called expected predictions. And so here the idea is that I have some function f, which could be my, uh, my decision tree, my neural network, and I observe the features xo, observed features, but then there's a bunch of features XM that are missing. And I would still like to get a prediction out of my model. Uh, and so the way that we'll do this is by having a probabilistic model of the world, just like I said on the previous slide, that takes these observed features as input and then has a posterior distribution on the missing uh, features. And so we will compute the expectation of this classifier uh, with respect to this distribution, which tells us what are realistic inputs to my classifier, what is the data distribution of my features. Okay, and uh, this seems kind of like a crazy task because this is probabilistic inference, right? You're doing probabilistic inference about a function that is, so, let's say, a random forest, right? So this seems crazy because it seems impossible. Um, well, it's actually possible and it works really well, even if you have a trivial distribution and a trivial function. So here you see some uh, kind of early experiments with this approach where we compare where we use a naive base model to take an expectation of a logistic regression model. And we compare it against what really everyone in, in the, the sciences is doing, which is imputation to solve this problem. And so even for this very, very simple probabilistic world model, which is naive base, this is possibly the dumbest model we could have, could have used, already there, the accuracies are way higher for prediction uh, with missing data than uh, the imputation techniques that people are using. But of course, our goal is not to just have a dumb, naive base model as our probabilistic world model. We want to use these tractable probabilistic circuits in order to get some really efficient uh, expectations. And it turns out that, yes, you can do this. So here you see just another uh, syntax of a probabilistic circuit. This is a way that we represent uh, classifiers, uh, tree-based classifiers, for example. And so here, in almost the same way that I explained to you how you can compute marginals by breaking up an integration into pieces, also here, you can take an expectation for your expected prediction task and break it into pieces and recursively solve it on the circuit structure uh, efficiently in, in time that is polynomial in the size of these probabilistic circuits. Okay. If you then again compare to what people do today, which is uh, imputation, including multiple imputation techniques like mice. Mice is probably what everyone is using in like psychology for dealing with imputation. Again, these expected predictions uh, get you the highest accuracies and the lowest uh, root mean squared errors. Okay, And so this is a great example of how probabilistic world models can really help solve the problems of just supervised machine learning. Okay, moving on to the next uh, example is uh, how do I deal with uh, algorithmic fairness? Well, if you can compute expectations, you can also do uh, some, some really interesting things like asking, in the distribution over my uh, people that are my customers, um, how does the uh, predicted insurance price uh, change between female and male uh, applicants uh, for insurance? And then you see that uh, that women are paying a higher insurance price in this uh, in this particular predictive model for insurance prices. Okay, and so you can really start to ask questions about algorithmic fairness here. And if you really push this to the limit you can actually try to solve some algorithmic fairness problems by learning a probabilistic circuit. And so what we did in this paper here um, is to, uh, to learn a classifier 
that doesn't really treat the labels that it's given as the true labels, but it treats them as unfair labels that maybe incorporate some racist or sexist bias or whatever bias there is. And what we'd like to figure out is what is the fair decision that was the actual underlying latent variable uh, such that it's independent of the sensitive attributes. So it doesn't take, for example, race into account, but it also explains the observed unfair decisions. And so this is a latent variable model. Uh, however, it's a very complicated one and you need to really fit the data and you also want to be tractable, right? Because you have to model this data in a way that you know, is solving, uh, you need to solve EM, it's intractable. So the solution here is to learn again, a probabilistic circuit. Okay, you and then you better. see if you, ah, yeah, great. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'll be done in, in three minutes, hopefully. Awesome. Um, so if you use this latent variable probabilistic circuit model, then uh, you see that you're uh, more accurate while also being uh, less discrimi discriminating uh, based on the, the, pr the protect protected attributes. Okay, last example of how probabilistic world models can solve machine learning issues is in explainability. And so here we have a line of work um, which is trying to explain instances of classification, uh, local explanations. So why were these two MNIST images classified the way they were by our uh, machine learning model? And so maybe you don't think of this as a problem where you need a distribution at all, uh, but it turns out that, that yes, it is very intuitive to think about this, this problem as a problem of the data distribution. So specifically what you want is uh, something that is a probabilistically sufficient explanation. So what does that mean? It means that uh, whatever the explanation will be, it will give us a little bit of information and that little bit of information should be sufficient under the data distribution to make the prediction that the model made, right? So what are really the essential pieces of information that in the data distribution will cause me to classify this image the way that I did? And you also want this to be simple. And so here's then some output of this model. Um, this is an explanation for why this was classified as a five and the gray pixels are the ones that are marginalized out, they're unknown. And you can kind of see a five here. This is an explanation for why this was classified as a three because you see that really these pixels here kind of represent a three and in my data distribution, this, this information is enough for the model to start concluding that the image is a three even though it was really a five. All right, so that's a very quick overview of how you can use these probabilistic circuits to, to solve some of these problems. Now to wrap up for one or two more minutes, I promised you something about probabilistic programs, right? Probabilistic programs were the other type of model that had this computational abstraction. And so here I wanna point you at uh, the talk that Stephen Holson is gonna give in 25 minutes about uh, DICE, which is our new probabilistic programming language for discrete uh, probabilistic programs. And um, why, why is this connected to probabilistic circuit? Well, it turns out that the way uh, that you do inference in these programs is by compiling them through some pipeline into a probabilistic circuit, right? Uh, you essentially convert your intractable probabilistic program where computing marginals is uh, sharply hard and you, you don't really know how to do it. You, you, you exploit the structure in the program in order to get a a compact probabilistic circuit. And once you have the probabilistic circuit, you just run the algorithm that I showed you. And it, it allows you to compute the marginals you care about, okay? And so uh, this is really the state of the art for discrete probabilistic program inference. It's also an approach taken by, for example, Problock in probabilistic logic programming. And it's really, really fast. Okay, so conclusions of my talk. Um, I think we are already in the age of computational abstractions of distributions. Why? Because we already have two examples, probabilistic circuits and probabilistic programs, and both are getting increasingly popular. Uh, probabilistic circuits, you can think of as a type of deep generative model, a deep probabilistic model. However, one that is tractable. And so one that allows you to understand what types of queries you can compute and which ones you cannot. And then probabilistic programs, of course, I don't have to convince you, uh, is the new type of uh, probabilistic knowledge representation language. And these are very closely related because um, you can compile your probabilistic programs into your probabilistic circuits for inference. And this is not just a cute exercise. This is the state of the art way of getting your probabilities. Uh, so I should uh, then thank you and also thank my students and postdocs who did the real work. Uh, a whole bunch of them are graduating and uh, they're actually going on the academic job market. And so specifically, uh, Yitao Liang and Antonio Vergari, who worked uh, on probabilistic circuits and did a lot of seminal work there, they're on the academic job market. So feel free to reach out if you're 
interested in talking to them, for example. All right, thanks. I'll just briefly applaud for the audience. So we do have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, and we're a little bit short on time, so I will pick oh, off I'm the, sorry. Most, uh, the most popular questions, uh, and then I'll encourage people whose question we didn't get to to follow up with you. Um, and I'll wrap maybe two questions together. One is from Neymar Aurora, and one is from Michael Tingley. And the first question is, how user-friendly are probabilistic circuits for purpose of knowledge representation and then the second question is how much human intuition and engineering is necessary to design one of these probabilistic circuits and is it possible to discover the structure of these circuits automatically oh so these are all great questions so i'll try to give very short answers so how human readable are these probabilistic circuits they're not right so they will have maybe 10 million parameters they're, they're exactly like a neural network exactly like a vae except they're better in the sense of being tractable uh, so the way that you would model them is just say, I want 25 layers and I want, you know, it's just like you use neural networks. So that's why I think probabilistic programming is important in conjunction with probabilistic circuits, because probabilistic programs will give you the human readable structure, and then you can still mix and match them and learn the probabilistic circuit given the probabilistic program structure and so on and so on. So that was one question. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember the others. Uh, um, yes, I guess the other one was about how user friendly it is for knowledge representation, which I think you've you've more. Or yeah, less which which I asked. Oh, one of the questions was how do you learn them the structures? Mm -hmm. So I would really encourage you to look at the tutorial where uh, Robert Pehas speaks for an hour about how do you get these structures, how do you estimate the parameters, uh, what is maximum likelihood learning in this context, and so there's there's all sorts of algorithms there that work really well. Great, and so then I'll ask one more question, which is from Vakash, um, uh, which is, have you identified classes of generative processes with dynamic memory allocation or control flow, for example, PCFGs, that still admit smooth, decomposable, tractable representations? Uh, that's a great question, right? So at some level, if you, let's say, have a open universe model like blog, then of course, a probabilistic circuit that is not open universe is not gonna solve it, right? So you need to maybe think of some extensions of this basic framework. Um, things like PCFGs though, they have compact probabilistic circuits. So uh, I know this because for example, Angelica Kimmich's PhD thesis exactly explains how PCFGs can be turned into probabilistic BDTs. Uh, so, so those are already covered. All right, let's, uh, let's I, I was gonna say, let's thank the speaker, but I guess the audience can't thank the speaker except in chats. Uh, thank you so much, Kai, he for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna ask the next speaker to uh, turn on their video. That's Akansh Sharma.